I would like to welcome everyone today to American Dairy Association Northeast virtual farm tour for our high school aged students. Um, I'd like to welcome you down to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, where we're going to be touring Joe Bo Halsteins. And we're going to start with a nice opening drone shot of the farm today. So this is Joe Bo Halsteins in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Joy Weiderman will be giving our tour today. She is one of the farmers here at Jobo Halsteins that's responsible for taking care of these cows every day and producing a wholesome product um, like milk that can be turned into milk, cheese, yogurt, and other scrumptious dairy products for you to consume. As you can see from this drone shot, this is up above the farm. You can see the pile where they keep the feed, which we're gonna learn about, and also the free stall barns where they house the cows. So with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Farmer Joy to open up our tour today. Hi, I'd like to welcome everybody to Jobo Holstein Farm. Here I farm with my family, my parents, Sean and Bonnie. They moved here in 1970 from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Over the years, we, we grew the farm to our existing thousand cows that we milk today. Um, and we did that so that my siblings and I could all be a part of it. Um, my siblings, uh, my sister Joe, my brother John, and my brother-in-law Dale, and myself, we all support our families off this farm. They say the average farm to support a family needs to be about 200 milking cows. So we grew our farm to 1,000 so we could all raise our families on the farm. Um, so we farm 1,000 acres uh, and milk 1,000 cows three times a day, 365 days a year. So uh, yeah. So it's a lot of fun working with family. Um, here is where, these are called our, our hutches. These are our calves. When a calf is first born, she is fed colostrum, which is the mother's first milk. Um, so a calf is not necessarily born with the immunity that she needs. So when we feed her colostrum, that is helping her, giving, giving her the, the immunity to help build her immune system up so that she can be healthier and stronger. So these calves are fed milk two times a day for about two months. Now these calves here you're seeing, they're actually weaned. They had just been weaned here in the last week. So they're a little bit, uh, you know, anxious because they're used to getting milk. So they're seeing us hoping we're gonna feed them milk. But of course, like I said, they are officially weaned, no longer getting milk. They'll move out of these hutches here in about uh, another week. Once we make sure they've all accepted that they no longer get milk and they're all taking off and doing very well. Um, but once, they're, once they are in the hutches, they are fed Free choice grain. Okay, these guys weren't fed yet today. So, <laughs> so uh, we uh, feed them grain twice a day. And the grain that they get looks like this. And this has everything in it that they need to be healthy and strong. Just like, like uh, yourselves, they need to have the right nutrients to grow up and be healthy and strong. So now a calf, they will age a little quicker than what you and I would. A, a, a calf will reach mature age by the time she's two, so her life is her life goes a little quicker. So by the time she's 15 months old, we're actually breeding her to have her first calf. And when they move out of these hutches, we actually will um, remove their horns, which if you look, if you look on the, if we find one that'll let me pet her. If you look, they have horns growing. They are horned animals, but as they grow, the horns get larger. So we do do a process where we cauterize and remove their horns. We do this, uh, we actually novocate them so they don't feel anything. And uh, it actually helps them so that they don't harm themselves or the people that work with them. So we'll do that when they leave these hutches, along with give them vaccinations, just like you and I needing vaccination, calves will also need vaccination. When they leave these hutches, they'll go into group pens. Um, I usually generalize that as like a preschool type uh, for the calves. Like when you were younger, you went to preschool to learn how to interact with other kids. Calves go into group pens so that they can learn how to interact with other heifers. And then from there, they'll grow up together and go through the process until they become milk cows. Now, they won't become an official milk cow until they have their first calf. And as I said, they'll get bred at about 15 months old. So then I'll put a have them their first calf at approximately two years old. Um, 
Awesome. We did, have a, so. we did have a question come in um, about the calves and calf rearing. So all the calves that you said on your farm are female. Um, so what do you do with the male offspring that are sold? Um, and do those calves become veal? And that's coming from a culinary program that's joining our tour today. So yes, everything that we raise on our farm is heifer calves. The bull calves, we actually have a few local farmers that buy our bull calves to raise for beef. Um, and then occasionally some will go to auction where a possibility a veal facility will buy them. Um, uh, the, the few veal facilities I've been on are very well uh, taken care of farms. Um, and they're, they're, they're um, yeah, I'm not really sure where else to, to go with that question, but yeah, I, that's kind of what ours do. Awesome. Great. So what we're going to do now is we're actually going to transition to the adult cows, which are actually just called cows on the farm. We're going to play a parlor video due to some connectivity issues at Jobo. Um, we don't get good Wi-Fi service in the parlor. So we're going to play a pre-recorded video. In the meantime, Joy's going to head out to the freestyle. Now we're in the milking parlor. Our parlor is a double 18 herringbone milking parlor. Um, it was built in 1997. Uh, so it's starting to show its age, but it still does an excellent job of milking our cows three times a day, 365 days a year. Um, we could milk, as I said, 36 cows at a time in here. We focus on milking one side, which is 18 cows. And then while they're milking, then we'll focus on milking the other side, which is 18 cows. Everything that makes our parlor work is actually in the basement. It's actually a subway parlor. So it's actually underneath of us. All that's up here is the milkers themselves and the meters that we use to uh, the computer systems that put the milkers on. But all the mechanics and everything of the parlor are below us. I'm checking the milk on the cow to make sure like everything's healthy with the milk. And then I'm gonna dip her with an iodine foaming cream that, or a foamer that, uh, Helps sterilize and clean the teeth off. And then I'll wipe this all off to get their teeth good and clean. And then I'll apply the milker. An average cow will milk out in about uh, three to four minutes. Some a little longer, depends how much milk she gives. Um, but I would say an average cow here milks out in about three and a half minutes. We milk our cows three times a day, 365 days a year. Um, we do this to help keep them healthy. It keeps their milk, um, their udders don't get as full. It doesn't stress them as much. Our cows are currently averaging 82 pounds a day. And that equivalates to approximately 10, gallon, 10 gallons of milk. So then as we see here, the cows will be milking out. And you'll see, like I always tell people that when a cow comes into the parlor, they kind of look like a grape. They're full, they're plump. And as they milk out, it'll try to change to a raisin. You'll see they get kind of wrinklier. Their udders will get like a softer texture to it. Um, and these, everything in here is computerized and it senses when the milk flow slowed down so that the cow, then the milker knows to come off. Um, most times, as I said, it takes about three and a half minutes. You do have a casual cow that will take up towards five, but three and a half minutes is pretty much so typical. We don't really want the cows to be standing in the parlor more than about eight minutes. Um, a cow's job is really not to be standing in the parlor a lot. She's supposed to come in, produce her milk, and we want to get her back to her comfort in her barn as quick as possible. So then we dip them when we're finished with an iodine solution. So then at, once the cows are done milking, I can show you where the milk goes to from here. I can take you there and we'll head there next. So in here, this is the milk house. The reason we call it the milk house is because it's where the milk lives. So we were just in the parlor and you saw the cows being milked. 
the milk actually is pumped over to these big bulk tanks. These bulk tanks hold 6,000 gallons of milk. These, ta these tanks are emptied every 16 hours here at the farm. Now, when we're bringing that milk over from the cow, the cow's body temperature is 101.3. So that milk is 101.3 degrees. But it is our goal to get it as cooled down as quick as possible. So as it's flowing through the pipes to, to these bulk tanks, it goes through what's called a plate cooler. And that is a system that helps to cool the milk even faster so that when it hits these tanks, it's already started the cooling process. Now these tanks here get the milk as cold as quick as possible. So we have to get it to roughly 38 degrees. So this tank here just started filling this morning. So it's currently at 43. By the time within three hours, it should be at roughly 38, 30, 34 to 38 degrees is where we want it. You don't want it to go under 34 because then you start flirting with the freezing process and you don't want the milk to freeze. So it's always our goal to keep it as cold as possible. Every time this milk is emptied or this tank is emptied, it is sterilized and washed with, um, with a sterilization system that we have to be inspected once a month by our co-op, Land of Lakes, to make sure that we pass all those health and safety guidelines. We have to score at least a 92% or higher. Um, and it is our goal here at Jobo to score as close to 100, if not 100, as possible. If we don't score those scores, if they find something wrong, we can't ship milk. Um, it's very, very important that we are shipping the healthiest and cleanest product that we can possibly. So in that process of checking the cleaning process to make sure everything, they also, our milk inspector also evaluates our protocol for how we take care of our cows. It is very important that we do not sell any cow, any milk with antibiotics in it because it's against the law. So none of our animals, none of the milk that hits this tank has antibiotics in it. Now, if you have the question about whether we treat an animal with an antibiotic, if we have an animal that is sick, we will treat her with an antibiotic. But that being said, she no longer can go in the main milk stream. She no longer can, I can no longer sell her milk, and I have to send her, she lives in her own barn, a hospital barn, which at some point we will see. Um, she'll live in the hospital barn until she has became healthy and passed all the tests so that I can send her back into the main stream. This can take anywhere from 10 days to as long as 35 or 40 days to get a cow clean enough to resell her milk. So when, so when we want to take care of our cows, we want to do everything we can to make sure they're healthy, but we also want to make sure we are selling a healthy and clean product to our consumers. If, the, if it accidentally happened that a farmer was to sell antibiotics in her milk, the milk is tested. So every time a tanker comes to pick up our milk, it is tested. And, um, Knock on wood, it has never happened here, but if it would happen that there would be antibiotics in the milk, we'd have to dump that load of milk. We are not allowed to sell it. Um, if it passes and gets through, then, then we can start to get fined. We can get fined from our co-op. We can actually be shut down. We can actually not l sell milk. So it's, it's a pretty, pretty serious thing to sell milk with antibiotics in it. Um, yeah, once it's tested here, then it gets tested before it's unloaded at the, the bottling plant. Um, and then it's tested again before it goes into the process. So it goes through several tests to make sure there's nothing in it. Um, and again, if it gets caught, it equals large fines, it equals um, not being able to sell your milk. Um, it's just not something we would want to do or anybody would want to do for that matter. Awesome. So great information there from Joy. Um, a question did come in. Um, you ship to Lando Lakes, but where specifically, what products does your milk go into, Joy? So our milk predominantly goes to uh, Mount Holly Springs, and that's a butter plant. Um, every now and then it'll go uh, to help fill orders a little bit further south uh, in, in, in Georgia, Virginia, but prim primarily ours goes to Mount Holly Springs for butter. Awesome. And then two other questions came in kind of pertaining to the health benefits of milk. Um, the first one is why is milk a part of a healthy eating plan? So the so milk's uh, one of the most healthy drinks you can drink because of all the vitamins and uh, nutrients in it. You, you know, it's full of calcium, uh, vitamin D, vitamin, I mean, there's just endless opportunities for what it is, but it's beyond that. It's the most all natural drink you can drink. Um, you know, you know when when you go to sporting events and you're and you're playing a game and you're really wore out. If you drink a cup of like chocolate milk at the end, it'll give you that energy and give you the vitamin that you need to replenish. Um, you know, it, 
there's nothing that's added to milk. It's all 100% natural. So there's not many drinks. There's only a few drinks out there that are like that. Um, so, you know, that's an added benefit to it. Awesome. And then another question is kind of based around potential confusion. Why are other so-called milks not actually milk? Well, this is an interesting question and it's kind of a, uh, a hot topic for dairy farmers. So um, milk is, an all, is, a, is a product of a producing a mammal. So how you can get milk from a nut or a soybean or um, yeah, all those other things out there that they're selling as milk um, is beyond me because it's not an all natural product. It didn't come from a, a, a mammal uh, producing animal. The only one product that they do technically call the liquid inside of it milk is a coconut. So that, you know, if you look that up in the dictionary, that is actually the what coconut, the juice inside of a coconut is called milk. However, you can't make milk from a nut. So it actually takes, uh, it actually takes more of a, a factory, more of an imprint uh, to make uh, almond milk or, and, I, and as a dairy farmer, that hurts me to say almond milk. I, I would prefer to say almond juice. So when you're thinking about milk, you're thinking about an all natural product, a product that doesn't take, you know, anything added to it to make it. It's just, it's 100% natural all on its own. So to sell an almond uh, juice as an almond milk, uh, it actually took like, more manpower to make that so that's why it's so hard for a farmer to be okay with the fact that we call almond milk milk um not saying there's not a need for those products out there because there is for the people that have allergies and whatnot but um yeah it should really not be called a milk awesome great response um and then also we had a question come in about um does milk get graded for quality or tested for harmful pathogens and I think Joy did a great job answering some of those questions in the milk house. If you have any other specific questions pertaining to that, please just write it in via the Q&A feature. Um, but I'm gonna let Joy take it away and talk a little bit about how they care for the cows when they're not in the milking parlor. Um, so I showed you the calves before and I talked about how they become cows once they have their first calf at, at two years old. Um, and when they have their first calf, this is actually where they come to. They come to what we call a freestall barn. A freestall barn is a, built, is a barn built that has stalls in it that they can freely lay wherever they'd like in those stalls. So they, that's why it's called a freestall barn. Now, if you look behind the cows here, the cows are out front eating. If you look behind the cows, the freestalls are actually bedded with sand. That sand is much like you and I would maybe go to the beach and lay on. However, it's recycled sand. So. That sand, we actually, every uh, time the cows go to the parlor to be milked, we actually flush the barns out with water and then we reclaim that sand. So it actually goes, once I talk about our manure handling system later, you actually, um, I'll actually explain to you how we separate the sand and we can stack it up. And then over a process of time, the, the, the liquid will drain off of it and it'll become dry enough that we can reuse it. It's just one of the many ways that we recycle and try to be more efficient here at Jobo. So also in this freestyle barn, you will see the black pipe above their heads. That's actually a sprinkler system. That, that system is in the summertime when it's really hot, just like you and I get hot, so do the cows. Their ultimate temperature is about 65 degrees. They don't, they don't like it a whole lot hotter than that. So you wanna do everything you can to make them as comfortable as possible. So what we will do is we will have sprinklers run on them while they eat, and then the fans will cool them off and keep them dry. Again, a lot like you and I, we might jump in the swimming pool to take a swim in the summertime, and then you may stand in front of a fan to cool off or go run around the yard and then jump back in the pool. Cows are a lot like that. They, they like to be cooled off. These fans and these sprinklers are set with thermostats. So once the temperature gets above about 70 degrees, then the fans will kick on and about 72 degrees is when the sprinklers will kick on. So it's kind of a neat thing when you think about it, that we're always trying to do everything we can to keep the cows as comfortable and cool as possible. So also, if you look in front of the cows here, this is their feed, all right? And in this feed, again, and I say a lot of times, just like you and I, but the cows need the right nutrients to, to survive and be healthy. So this particular group of cows you're looking at is milking about 80 pounds a day. So 80 pounds a day would equivalent to roughly 10 gallons of milk. So we not only have to feed them a, a, a ration or 
a um, diet so that they can be healthy to produce that amount of milk, but also to make sure we keep the right amount of weight on their backs and keep them healthy so that they're growing. So in this, this uh, uh, not growing, maintaining, in this particular feed here, which this is called TMR, which stands for total mixed ration. Now in here, you can see there's chopped up corn. Um, and then you, like, just like you and I, again, we can't necessarily digest the corn kernels. So for cows, we will break it up into very small pieces to make it easier for them to digest. Because the corn is an excellent base of energy for them. But again, we have to make it so they can digest it. Also in here, there's chopped up hay or rye leach. Now, the reason this has a brown, because of course you see it out in the field and it's green, but in this, in this particular feed here, it looks brown. That's because it's fermented. And actually, uh, we have to ferment it over approximately two months or longer, just so that the cows can get the right nutrients out of it. Then you also see in here, there's really fine pieces of mineral and vitamins and different, different added things to put in there. Um, sometimes we actually feed the cows something called cotton seed, which is what, you know, the cotton is taken off the seed for your shirts, and we'll actually feed the seed to cows. Um, some farmers may feed chocolate to their cows. Um, at one time, we actually were feeding um, citrus pulp, which is actually orange, oranges ground into like uh, pellets. So there's all kinds of cool things that we try and feed the cows so that they can be healthy and uh, productive. Awesome. We had On this particular pen, we had a question come in, Joy, from Pam Kissing's class. How much does a dairy cow eat in one day? A dairy cow approximately eats 100 pounds of grain or feed a day. Um, so, yeah, they're always eating. They eat quite a bit. And they also drink quite a bit. They actually say that a cow will drink the equivalent of a bathtub full of water a day. So it, it takes a lot to take care of our cows and keep them healthy and um, and full. <laughs> awesome. We had another question come in from Abors Miss Aborso's class, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Apologize, apologies if I didn't. Um, why do they have tags in their ears? Oh, the tags in their ears? So the tags in their ears are to help with the identity of them. So as the cow that you're looking at here, 7987 is her number, which all of our cows actually uh, have like a computer chip in their other ear, which is the round button. It's an RFID radio frequency identification device. So everything, our milking parlor here, everything that with our cows is actually on a computer. I can actually look on my cell phone and know what's going on with my cows. But in order for me to do that, I have to be able to see that the number in their ear so that I can follow their their uh, identity. So on that tag is their identity, 7987. Her birth date on that tag will also say who her sire is, which her sire is her father. Everything here is artificially inseminated. So as we're working with the cows, that helps us as the person that's working with us, helps us keep track of, of their general pedigrees and um, information. Awesome. Uh, we have quite a few good questions coming in. Again, from Pam Kissing's class, how much does a cow cost a year? Um, how much does it cost to feed them? How is them? And that might be a rough estimate. I know it can sometimes be tough to know the exact dollar amount. So it, it costs us approximately $9 a day to feed our cows. Um, I'd have to do math to really put everything into it, like to add the electric and um, general equipment costs and all that. Yeah, I would say a year you're probably looking at, uh, I'd probably say you're looking at $1,000 to raise a cow, give or take. Um, it's not a cheap, it's not like having a dog in your backyard. Um, I know that they say from the time a baby calf hits the ground till she is ready to be a productive milking cow, you're going to have approximately $2,000 in her um, to take care of her, to breed her, to have the vet expenses and everything here. So again, to, to take care of a cow, it's not a cheap venture. That's why sometimes tough decisions have to be made to take care of your cows. Ultimately, dairy farmers truly love, truly love the animals they're taking care of, but it is not a cheap venture. So sometimes we have to make decisions based around the expenses. Awesome. And then a, a question from Ms. Catherine Delaney's classroom. What precautions are in place to prevent the spread of infection or disease among the cows in the barn population? 
So we do a lot of vaccinations here. From the time they're first born, they're getting vaccinations. Um, we uh, also, any cow that comes in here has to actually be, um, if she's never been here before, she actually has to go through like a quarantine process where she's kind of by herself to make sure that she doesn't have any kind of diseases that we can spread to our herd. Um, so we, we do heavily, we do do a lot of vaccinations here, much like you would have had to get vaccinations to enter school, vaccinations to maintain your status in school. We have to do that for cows too. Awesome. And we have a few more questions, but I want to, if you have a few more points you want to cover, we can come back to the questions unless you want to answer them now. Uh, well, no, I just kind of wanted to touch base on the different breeds of cows that you're seeing here. The yeah, black and white great. ones, of course, are... The black and white ones, of course, are Holstein. Um, the, the one that I showed you earlier, the 7987, she's a brown Swiss. Um, brown Swiss can vary in color from as light as, uh, as light as, and actually this cow has a name. Her name is actually Parton. She's named after a lot of famous, her cow family is, uh, is named after like a lot of famous singers, like her, her mother was a uh, pickler, or excuse me, her daughter's name is Pickler. So we're always looking for neat tea names to go along with famous singers for that particular cow family. But they can range, brown Swiss can range from as light of color as that to a darker color, like 8543 here, that's also a brown Swiss. Now she does have some Holstein mix in her, so she's kind of a mixed breed as we call her. Uh, the next one up, 8216 is actually a red and white Holstein. She's just like the black and white ones, except for her color is a red color. So there's there's several different breeds of cows here. We actually milk uh, four different breeds of cows here. Um, the brown Swiss and the Holstein are roughly the same size. Now, if we had a jersey to point out to you, they tend to be smaller. They tend to be smaller cows. A mature jersey weighs about uh, 1,300 pounds. Yeah, this is, that's actually a brown Swiss. This one here is a Jersey. So a mature Jersey probably will weigh about 12 to 1300 pounds, whereas a mature Holstein will probably weigh up close to 1700 pounds. Now this particular group that you're looking at right now, they're all first lactation cows. They're all two year olds. So of course, as a cow gets older, she'll grow and develop and mature a little more. She'll get bigger. So uh, as you see them get older, they will tend to grow and be larger in size. Um, awesome. I had a question come in. How many cows are born at your dairy each year? And that's also from Pam Kissing class. So we have approximately uh, 500 heifers and probably 600 bull calves born here a year. Um, once the milking herd is, is once a cow becomes a, a milk cow, once she's had her first calf, it is your goal to have her have a calf about every 13 months. The reason for doing this is because when she has a calf, her milk supply comes in to, um, her milk supply comes in. So the further she goes away from having that calf, the less milk she actually will produce. So in order to her to rejuvenate her milk supply, you need her to have another calf. So to do so, we have to have her have a calf about every 13 months. So since we milk about a thousand cows, that means roughly a thousand cows will have calves throughout the year. We, we let the cows calve year round, we don't do seasonal calving. Um, so we could have cows, calves born any day of the week. And I would say an average day here, there's at least one calf born a day. Some days there's as many as uh, 15 calves born, which makes it pretty chaotic for the person taking care of the baby calves. But uh, we all do this because we, we love it and truly love what we're doing. So uh, it just makes every day interesting. Awesome. We kind of have a two-part question from Pam Kissing's class. First is, how long is the working day at the dairy? You know, how many hours a day is someone at your farm working? And then specifically, how, specifically, how long is your work day every day? So there is actually someone here 24 hours a day. There's actually somebody in the barn 24 hours a day. As I said before, we milk cows three times a day. So that pretty much so means we're milking cows Around the clock. Um, so there's always someone here. Um, an average work day for someone can vary anywhere from, from eight hours to as many as 16 hours, depending on what's going on, um, depending what crops need to come in, what the weather is going to do. I know in the fall when we're trying to get the corn off the field, if they're calling for rain or bad weather, we might work a, work a really long day to get 
the crops in. Um, my day particularly starts at 4 a.m. in the morning. Um, I usually go home to see my kids off to school, which I have three kids that are roughly the age that I am talking to today. They're, they're eighth, uh, 10th and 11th graders. So I go home to see them off to school and then I'm back here at the farm. Um, and my day varies. It depends on what all is going on. Last night, uh, I got home about a quarter of six, or excuse me, a quarter of seven. So my day was roughly, uh, roughly a 12 hour day with a, with a little break to go see my kids off to school. So it just varies. Um, there's always something going on and it just depends at what point you decide, hey, you, you need to go home and be in your house. The number one thing we do is make sure that our cows are taken care of, that we've done everything we can to do to take care of those cows. And then uh, after that, it's kind of what else needs to be done to, to finish our day out. All right, so I'm gonna ask one more question before we move on to the manure management portion of our tour. And it's from Miss Catherine Delaney's classroom, specifically from Brooke. How long will it take the cows to eat that meal? Or is it left out all the time and they can eat at their own pace? So the cows actually, it's out, it's in front of them 24 seven. So like uh, in the morning, um, we have somebody that starts off their day by cleaning the trough up. So that means they go through and any leftover stale feed laying from the day before, they'll clean out and the cows will start with fresh feed. So at about uh, approximately 6 a.m., cows are fed fresh feed. And then that feed is pushed up about every hour to every hour and a half, we come through and actually push that feed so it's closer to them, so that we're constantly stirring the feed so that it's kind of a, it's fresher for them. So this, this feed that you see in front of them now will be with them till tomorrow morning um, when we clean it out to give them fresh. Now, of course, tomorrow morning, when you see it, there won't be as much here, whereas now there's more here because they've just been fed not real long ago. So cows will graze all day. Um, it's kind of the same thing. I, I don't know if any of you ever heard the statement, you shouldn't graze like a cow because that means you're eating all day long, but that's ultimately what we want a cow to do. We want them to graze. We want them to eat all day long. Um, a truly happy, productive cow is a cow that's either eating, laying down. Uh, they're the two things we prefer. If she's, she's eating, she's happy, she's healthy, and she's, you know, filling her belly. And if she's laying down, she's resting, and she's uh, comfortable and making milk. So that's our goals here. Um, uh, something that's kind of cool that I like to tell people or tell kids is, you notice how the cows make little bowls in their feed? A cow will dig out her own bowl. When we come through here and we push those bowls closed, that'll make them dig out new bowls. It'll make them eat more. It's kind of funny to watch because you can see cows that have their bowl all cleaned out exactly like they want it. And then when you come through and you push the feed up, they kind of look at you uh, like, wow, you just filled my hard work in. But a cow likes to make her own little bowl to eat out of. It's just their routine. So if you watch these cows eat, you'll see how they dig a bowl and they make their own little feed and that's how they eat. And then when you fill it back in, that makes them want to dig a new bowl and that makes them want to eat more. So again, it is our goal to keep them always eating and um, their bellies full. Awesome. So now we're actually going to play a video of the manure storage on the farm. And while we do that, Joy is going to talk about how farms recycle manure and use it not as waste, but actually as fertilizer um, and the ramifications they have to follow to manage that manure appropriately. So here's the video of the manure storage area. And if you have questions, type them into Joy, but without Further ado, Joy, you can take it away and talk about manure usage. So as I said earlier, we actually flush our barn um, and recycle our barn. So this here, what you're looking at is actually what we call our sand lane or our flush lane. And in here, the water actually, when we flush the barns out, the water goes to a drain at the end of the barns and then it goes under the ground and pipes to this system here that actually has like rumble strips that the, the liquid goes over and allows the sand to separate. Then every morning we'll go through and we'll clean the sand out and we'll stack it in the piles that you're seeing behind. It'll take about uh, six to eight weeks till it's dried down enough that we can reuse that sand. And we'll reuse it probably two times, two to three times before we'll add more sand to it to refresh the supply. Now what you're not necessarily seeing in this video is the liquid actually goes to an under, underground in pipe to a manure, uh, manure pit or lagoon 
which is actually like a large concrete pond um, that we actually have the manure stored in so that we can fertilize our fields with it. Um, that, that helps us so that we don't have to, to, uh, to we don't have to purchase any kind of fertilizer because we are able to spread it on our fields, the manure in our fields, and that helps our crops to grow. Uh, so we have a question from Miss L's class, specifically from Michael. You talked about manure being used as fertilizer, but what other stuff can manure be used for? Well, honestly, I think manure is primarily used here is fertilizer. Um, I know that there are some facilities that, that can turn uh, manure into electricity, but I don't truly know how that works, but I know there are some facilities that are doing that. But here it's only primarily used for fertilizer for our fields. And actually awesome. local farmers buy, their, buy manure from us to fertilize their fields also. Awesome, yeah. And um, another farm that we've done a virtual farm tour on, who's actually a good friend of Joy's, Katie Daughter Pile, at their farm they compost manure and they use it for bedding. Um, so lots of really good things you can do with manure. Um, since there's no other questions about manure at the moment, I'm going to pull up a photo of the feed bunk area. Um, so in this photo, you're going to see the big mixer truck that they mix up all the total mix ration in, and also the bunk silos. And we do have a question to go along with this, Joy, from Pam Kissing's class. What is the food a dairy cow eats and what's in that total mix ration? What's that a combination of? Can you ask that question again, Emma? Yeah, what is the food a dairy cow eats a combination of? So what's in a total mix ration? Oh, what's in a total mix ration? Yep. So in our total mix, in our total mix ration, it's, uh, we have uh, corn, rye, um, vitamins, uh, different minerals. There's some soybeans mixed in. Um, and basically what that is, is it's everything in that for a cow to make sure she's healthy. Um, it's got all the nutrients in it for her. And actually the truck that you saw in that picture is actually the mixer wagon that we put all the different things that we feed in there and mix it together. Um, the reason we do that is because cows, as I said earlier, make that bowl. Some cows will actually sort what they do and don't like in that bowl. So by mixing it all together, kind of in a casserole type based thing, that will actually uh, entice them or make them actually eat everything on their plate. Much like uh, I'm sure many of you, of the students do or of us, will sort out what we don't like and push it to the side. So by mixing it all together in a, in a casserole type thing, will make the cows have to eat everything on their plate. Awesome. Um, why is the bunk silo um, covered in plastic and tires? Can you talk about that a little bit? So as I said earlier, we fer ferment the feed. So that means that, you know, by fermenting it, we have to put, pack it really tight. So as we're bringing the feed in from the field, we actually have uh, uh, heavy equipment that runs over it and smashes it down really tight, much like you would seal a Tupperware container after supper to make sure that you know it keeps fresh. So we'll seal it really tight. Then we'll put a, a plastic, like a clear plastic, it reminds me of saran wrap. We'll put that over top to help seal it even tighter. And then we'll put the white plastic over top to protect it from the weather or anything else. And that helps keep it all sealed in. Again, much like a Tupperware container, we're sealing it really tight. And then that starts the fermenting process. As I, as I said earlier, we have to ferment the feed for the cows. Um, these cows here, they, they have four stomachs. Dairy, uh, dairy animals have four stomachs, or dairy cows have four stomachs. So in order to make their stomach work properly, you have to ferment the feed properly so that their stomachs can digest it. Unlike a, a horse or a dog, they don't have that, so they can't eat fermented feed. It'll make them sick. A cow needs to eat fermented feed, or, or I shouldn't say needs to, but it, it's what her stomach is actually made for is fermented feed. Awesome. We had a question come in from Pam Kissing. Will a cow eat out of another cow's bowl? Yes, yes, cows will do that. And actually, you'll see some cows that will fight over their bowls. But yeah, sometimes cows will work together. So cows are kind of cool creatures. They, they have personalities, much like you and I, or much like our dogs do. They all have their own unique personality. Some are really sweet. Some are really friendly. Some are really, you know, not as pleasant. 
and they're like that with their their cows that they're housed with they you might find some cows that are always together that you know are always buddies and then you might have some cows that are kind of loners and go off by themselves so so if you see two cows eating together they're probably good friends they probably hang together a lot and, and bond um, cows are herding creatures they don't like to be by themselves they want to be with other cows they want to be around other animals so generally if you see a cow off by herself that means something's probably not right she doesn't feel good or something's got her bothered and then you really want to look at her a little closer awesome we had a question a couple of questions came in um, kind of around processing so there's a few of these um, First, after cows are milked, and this is from Catherine Delaney's classroom, after cows are milked, where does the milk go to get to market? How is it graded, pasteurized, homo and homogenized? Um, so there's a question for you. I know you don't work on the processing end, but if you can answer that question for us. So once the cow's milked, as you saw in the video earlier, it goes to the bulk tank where it's stored until the milk truck comes and picks it up. And then the milk truck, of course, takes it, and I'm just going to use Mount Holly Springs, for instance, because that's where the predominantly most of our milk goes through. So then it goes there, and uh, it's actually sent through a process where it's tested. So not only is it tested to make sure that it's, it's antibiotic-free here at the farm, but it's tested that it's antibiotic-free at the milk plant. And then it's like when it arrives at the plant, then it's also tested again before they start putting it through the process to be uh, packed or made into butter. Um, and Emma, maybe you can help answer that question a little more because once it gets to the um, Mount Holly Springs and they start doing the homogenization and uh, pasteurization, and actually to make butter, I don't know if they go through quite all that, but um, maybe you can help field that question because I'm not sure if I know exactly what process it goes through once it hits Mount Holly Springs. Yeah, so and this ties in perfect. We have two questions that came in. Um, what's the difference between whole milk, 2% and 1% milk? So when a milk enters a processing plant, um, one of the processes they can do is homogenization. Um, and prior to doing homogenization, which essentially breaks up the fat gabulates, that actually allows them to pull the fat out of milk. That fat can be utilized to create um, heavy cream, which is one of our questions that was asked, how is heavy cream made? Heavy cream is essentially pulling the fat content out of milk and then reinstituting it into a product product to create a higher fat percentage, which would create your heavy cream. And then the difference between whole milk, 1% and 2% milk is actually a standardization that is regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. And that's actually the fat content that's in a serving of milk. So in an eight ounce serving, if you're drinking 1% milk, you have 1% fat. And for 2% milk, you'd have 2% fat. And for whole milk, you'd have 3.2% fat in that glass. So although, you know, it's called whole milk, so you're like, oh, what's the percent fatage in that eight ounce serving? That's actually only 3.25% fat. Um, and also tying into that, how is lactose removed from lactose-free milk? And what do you think about it as a product? So to talk about that process a little bit, lactose is removed in the processing plant. They actually... Um, have filters that can pull out that lactose and break down that enzyme. So if you do have a lactose intolerance, they break it down to lactase so then you can digest it. Um, I think it's a great product that helps people consume dairy. Um, I'll pass it off to Joy. Um, what are your thoughts on lactose-free milk? Um, so I think that lactose-free milk is a necessity uh, for the people out there that uh, that have that allergy. Um, my niece has an allergy to lactose, so I think it's very important as needed. Um, we actually are, there are, um, they are developing a different way to breed your cows to help with some of those, because there's people that actually are um, allergic to like the proteins in milk, so they're actually developing like an A2, A2 milk, and that actually starts with, uh, here at the farm, we can actually start breeding our cows to bulls that are, um, positive for A2, A2, that'll help make that milk less than protein. I think it's the protein that's in it that some people, so there's all kinds of different things that we're always doing to try and make it so milk can be even healthier or better for, I shouldn't say healthier because it's as healthy as it can be, but even better for people that maybe have those allergies. Um, 
me personally, I, I'm a whole milk kind of person. Um, and I always think it's funny when somebody says that they, uh, they don't drink whole milk because it's fattening. But actually, the way they should put that is whole milk is 97% fat free. So I always find that kind of funny that, you know, that, that, you know, there's 2% and there's 1% and there's skim, but whole milk is only 3% fat. So it's kind of a misleading label to say that, you know, whole milk is fattening because it's really 97% fat free. Awesome. So, so we have one more question we're going to squeak in here because we're about a minute over from Catherine Delaney's classroom. Does the diet of a cow affect the flavor profile of milk or milk products that it's um, that are made from it? Do some dairy farmers try to chase these superior flavors by changing their feed mixture? Um, so that's kind of a, I saw on a preference of taste. I would tell you that um, generally milk is all going to taste good no matter what ration or feed that you feed your cow. Um, some people say that grass fed milk, like a cow that's fed all grass, like an all, might have a different taste. But again, I think that's more of a, I think that's the person that's drinking it and their taste buds. I, I personally think milk all tastes really good. Um, it's all good for you. And every farmer is going to be different on how they feed their animals. Um, and I know every farmer is going to want to do the best for their animals and for their, and for their, uh, um, yeah, for their for their livelihood. So, but as to say that it tastes different, no, I, I don't think it's going to make a big difference in taste. Um, again, it's it's all on what your taste and your taste buds. Awesome. So that concludes our tour. Thank you everyone for some awesome questions today. Like I said, the recording will be sent out to all of you. You also do have access to our um, Young Minds Inspired Dairy Lesson Plans as well. So if you want to do some curriculum lesson plans in your classroom, you can do that with that resource link that was sent out to everyone. Also, if you have further questions from, for Joy, Jobo Halsteins is on Facebook. Feel free to follow their Facebook page um, and ask questions, more questions of Joy that way. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it off to Joy. Any last comments for our attendees today? Um, no, I hope everybody uh, got to got to experience more of a of an atmosphere of cow of a dairy farm. Um, I hope you enjoyed yourself. And again, I would encourage you to always ask questions. Um, there's a saying, don't ask Google, ask the farmer. So please, please do that. Please go to my Facebook page. Ask me any question you want, and I, I would be happy to answer it. Um, and, and again, thank you for attending. Awesome. Thanks so much, everyone, and have a great school day.